coming in, then we'll get to our, our main event. Um, before we get started, um, I just wanted to let you know that this is the last entrepreneurship program in the series of this fall, winter, spring series. Um, we'll be starting up again in the fall. Um, we don't have, we're working on our calendar right now. So um, if you're on our email blast list, we'll, we'll send that all out when it's all put together. Um, and then after, as you know, I hand out evaluations on the event. Um, and there's a little spot for indicating if there's any programs you'd like to see. So as we put that together, that'd be really helpful if you could um, indicate any programs or topics or speakers that um, really speak to you. Um, that really helps us. Um, I'm really honored tonight to bring in three entrepreneurs, very successful entrepreneurs. And this is everyone's always favorite, their favorite program that we put on here because everyone wants to know how how these um, entrepreneurs did it, how they got their business up and running. Um, and uh, you know, we, we often get a, a big attendance. And then we also, I think everyone really values the question and answer. Um, so what we're going to do, the format will be pretty informal. There'll be no PowerPoint. We'll have the speaker's um, website on the background just so you can see what their company is all about. Um, but we'll hold all question and answer until the end. So each person will speak, and then we'll do like a full question and answer, almost like a panel. So if you can hold your questions until the very end, that would be great. Um, tonight, we're going to start with Mr. Randy Mintz. He is the president of Burtman's Foods Company in Cleveland. And if you don't know Burtman's ballpark mustard, well, you should. Um, I always buy this ballpark mustard for my out-of-town family and friends because it's Cleveland. So, um, and, and they kind of get hooked on it and ask me for more. Um, he focuses on sales and marketing and oversees the ballpark brand of the company. Since 1925, Burtman's memorable spicy brown mustard used at League Park, Cleveland Municipal Stadium, Jacobs Field, and now Progressive Field for over 50 years has been proclaimed by fans as the best mustard in the world. So he'll be first. Who did you guys decide who wants to be second? <laughs> second. All right. Nice. All right. Courtney Gross is an engineer by training and an entrepreneur by, by nature. She was named on Forbes 30 Under 30 in clean tech for 2016. She focuses on supporting startup companies and small businesses. She's the founder and COO of the Clean Energy Comp Startup Design Flux Technologies, a company she started while an undergraduate at the University of Akron. <laughs> Pretty impressive. Um, until 2015, she worked full-time at the NASA Glenn Research Center as a sales manager, and she's currently pursuing a career in public speaking and career coaching services. Um, she also serves on the board for the Akron-based Launch League startup community and is a member of the Community Advisory Council for the EXL Center at the University of Akron. And finally, Catherine Miracle is an award-winning speaker, speaker and marketer. She founded in 2003 Miracle Resources, a marketing and training firm based in Akron. The firm provides consulting, training, and educational resources for businesses and nonprofits. She's worked with clients such as the Cleveland Clinic, Northwest Mutual, the American Red Cross, Dunkin' Donuts, a few big names. <laughs> Catherine's a professional speaker and a member of the National Speakers Association and Toastmasters International. She also teaches at the University of Akron and is the author of several books about marketing and increasing revenue. So please, we'll start with Randy Mintz. Enjoy. Thank you, Polly. Welcome everyone. I'd like to thank the Burton Morgan Foundation, the Hudson Library, the Historical Center for having me and our guest speakers uh, this evening. So thank you for all coming. I'm Randy Mintz. I'm the president of Burton Ballpark Mustard. We are, um, my background is marketing, licensing, branding, taking a product to market. Uh, the excitement behind it, how do I go about doing that? And I create a, a balance with that as well. Uh, my hobbies are antiques, garage sales, flea markets, uh, horses. Um, I, I've been riding horses since I've been a young kid, so uh, sometimes you need that little bit of uh, uh, a balance in your life and a little bit of therapy, and that's what I uh, lean towards. We are celebrating 91 years of Burtman Ballpark Mustard. Joe Burtman, in 1925, had a passion. He wanted to create a food line. He wanted to create 
uh, distribution business. And he had a many, many different variety of sauces, coffee, pickles, and just some type of formula that he was working on, he came up with a signature product, a mustard. So we were been pretty much short-lived for 91 years. Today, Bertman Ballpark continues to be an iconic brand through the state of Ohio and located in many other, country, many other uh, cities throughout the country. So there's a lot of excitement that's taken place at this time. There were three generations that ran Bertman Ballpark Mustard. We acquired the company last March, which is, happens to be very exciting for us. Um, how this came about is there were several other companies that were bidding for this iconic brand that's been around for a long time. And our application of the type of team that we have was the most important. Not so much just taking over a company. Their, their forecast was, are you going to continue the name? It was important that their grandfather's name, the longevity of Joe Bertman's name, continued forever. And that's first and foremost. The direction that we would take, they would be very open-minded because when you acquire a new company, many times uh, they realize that we have to go to a different direction. What they liked about our team was we weren't ready to purchase the company, we wanted to manage the company first. And we went into a, a, a managing agreement for one year with an option to purchase this company. That impressed them so we could get our feet wet. So we had to get a feel, decided if this was for us or not, and if we wanted to continue with this. We exercised the put agreement within six months, uh, not the full year. I want to share with you a little bit of the food industry, how the food industry pretty much works. How do we get a product like that on the shelves? Um, it takes a lot of time, regardless that we've been around a long time, but it's divided in many different facets of the food industry. You have retail and you have food services. Those are the two main ingredients. Besides all that, there's a lot of spin-offs that take place to get your product out there. But the food service is uh, very recognizable and we kind of lean towards the food service because of our margins. The food service consists of hotels and gross, uh, hotels and uh, schools and restaurants and country clubs and golf courses. So in the food industry, food service industry, they may purchase only six cases. So you could bring the margin up sometimes a little bit, but hopefully you have thousands of those locations. In the retail industry, those are your grocery stores, and that's our bread and butter. Um, and, and we need the grocery stores because that's where you guys do majority of your shopping. But when you're dealing with grocery stores, they dictate what they're gonna put on their shelves. The average grocery store, if you take a Heinen's, is approximately 48,000 products on their shelves. So if you can imagine how many people are trying to get their products on the shelves is, is mind-boggling because they have to decide, am I gonna take this new product? If I do, I have to drop somebody else. So you wanna keep your product, you wanna find a way, what does it take to keep the longevity with that particular store and your particular product. But what's interesting about retail is the reason most buyers of retail stores purchase your product is because the consumer dictates the demand for your product. They said, hey, I love this product, I'm gonna to continue to buy it. It's, I re remember when it was at Leak Park when Babe Ruth hit his 500 home run. And I know they mentioned that in the article briefly. So they remember when their grandfather or their father, and they're in their 70s and 80s now, when they were able to buy that hot dog and put that Burtman Ballpark mustard on that hot dog. Just, just a real quick story to remind. When I was in the, in the 60s, I know I look younger than my age, but in the 60s, when my father took me to the baseball game, and you're seeing is all the way down the aisle, and you, some of you could remember this, the hot dog man had that little tin box. He opens it up with the steam coming through, and you have to pass your money down, 
and then you're waiting for your chains to come by, and I couldn't wait for that hot dog. That hot dog finally came, and he puts that mustard all over it, which is the Burtman Ballpark mustard. I opened up the hot dog, and somebody took a bite out of the hot dog. <laughs> and, and by the time it got to me, you know, he, I guess he liked it, but the hot dog was still good, so I ate it anyways. The, um, um, and then with, with, with the um, uh, retail and, and f um, food services, now what are we going to do with the particular product? Okay, so I can't go to all the stores all over the state and many other states. So what I do is we hook up with distributors. So you have distributors for food service. You have distributors for retail. You have distributors for both. So you try to win the confidence of them because they want to represent a product like this, and we want to make sure they're going to do their job. You also have brokers, okay? So why do we need a broker like that? Well, distributors purchase the products. They have warehouses. So they buy the products from us, and they distribute it to so many different geographical areas that they uh, were able to get into. The brokers, depending on how much you grow, monitor the stores to make sure that it's in the, the right location, um, it's, the shelves are filled, and they report back to you as well. Um, sometimes the retailers don't like working with brokers, and brokers don't like working with retailers, but what's best for your product is, is uh, what you choose to do. Um, grocery stores, going back to the retail a little bit, you have um, uh, a lot of extra costs. We depend on them, they depend on us, but they're always looking for an edge. And I appreciate it, they're in business. They have a lot of products to represent. They want promotional dollars. They want slotting fees. A slotting fee is sometimes grocery stores charge you to put it in the middle of the shelf or at eye level instead of on the bottom of the shelf. So sometimes you have to pay for that. If you have a shipper, a shipper is your cardboard display. So with that, um, you know, they might charge us for a prime area if it's going to be in the aisle of that particular grocery store. So there's a lot of um, negotiating with that particular store. Hey, ballpark just started. Uh, the season just started. This is our busy season. Could we have a promotion for opening day in April, Memorial Weekend, Labor Day Weekend, then Christmas? So we want to create a schedule for them so they're not always calling us and saying, hey, I want a promotion at this time, could you do it? We want to make sure that they follow our schedule so we stay to our budget. Otherwise, you know, you could just be paying and paying and paying. Advertising dollars as well. Um, take advantage, which we are right now, of a website. Um, we have a brand new website that we just created and you're just seeing the beginning of it. Um, and people do purchase from a website. Social media is um, imperative. It is so valuable if you know how to work those tools, okay, um, just to get the name out there. Um, we are very fortunate to have one of the top chefs in the country that has been giving us some fantastic exposure. I don't want to give the secret away of what it cost us, but the price is phenomenal <laughs> because he promotes Cleveland and he promotes products that he believes in and that's the Iron Chef Michael Simon that many of you have heard of. Uh, Michael Simon just created a signature barbecue sauce and he's using Burtman Ballpark Mustard. So if you go to, um, I believe, the Rachel Ray Show last month, Nancy, and my general manager Nancy happens to be with us today, wave Nancy. Um, the uh, you will see the, uh, the clip of how he created his barbecue sauce and using the Burtman Ballpark mustard and promoting it. And we've been on the Rachel Ray show twice and on the Chew ABC uh, over a dozen times. Uh, Nancy and I experienced Mabel's for the first time on 4th and Euclid. Fantastic. I gave the manager a card. Um, we were listening very carefully as they go up to every table and take orders. And they said, by the way, try our Michael Simon signature barbecue sauce, Burtman Ballpark Mustard. They say that to every customer, which you, you can't, you know, buy advertising for that. It, it, it's amazing. He's a, he's a phen phenomenal guy. 
So Nancy and I are talking, and we're, we're going over and talking about the food, and all of a sudden this guy sits, move, he tells me to move over. It was Michael Simon. I didn't know that he was even there cooking that day. And that was, what, last week? Yeah. Last week, 10 days ago. So that was very exciting. He thanked us and all that, and we thanked him, of course, as well. Um, I spent a number of years being an entrepreneur, and I like to create fresh ideas. I like to take certain words, and I like to take the letters from the words and create words from the letters. So it just so happens that I was in a feed store picking up some carrots and apples and some treats for my horse, and um, I said, hey, this is a feed store. I want to create a word and create sentences from F-E-E-D-S. And I believe feeds is a word. I just checked that. Um, so for example, F for feel. So when I take on a project, I have to feel what I'm doing. I have to feel the part. I don't want to just go through the motions. I have to get excited about it. I have to have the, the, um, the passion. I have to have the motivation. And I definitely have to have the energy. And I have to decide if I'm going to take on that new product or not. E stands for execute. OK, so now that I want to create this new product or a new flavor, how do we go about executing it? Well, we did an example. We created Great Lakes Dortmunder Beer Mustard. So there's a lot that goes into that. One reason is they gave me the idea. Great Lakes called us, and they said, we'd like to do a mustard. Great. Let's maybe do a partnership together. And that's how that evolved. And it takes a lot of time and everything and, and work and all that. But now we have to go through the steps. Okay, What is it going to taste like? What kind of market do we want? What is the bottle going to look like? What is the label going to look like? Are we going to use this for an ancillary product? Or are we going to use this for one of our core products? So a lot of that ideas go into thought. Okay, And then I sit down with the people from Great Lakes, and Nancy and I go and brainstorm with them. And we talk about that. Their main objective and their main core product is selling beer, not mustard. Ours is mustard, not beer. But you have two iconic companies coming together. The press is going to eat this up. Great exposure for both companies. And now let's put this together and see if we, we can make it work. So we came up with the Dortmunder Beer, Bertman Original Great Lakes Brewery Company, Dortmunder Beer Mustard. And that's real Dortmunder Beer in there. We only ran into one problem, even though sales have been fantastic lately. I was never happy with the label. They decided they wanted to create the label. We take a lot of the risk. And it's a trial period. And you have to do the demos and get the feedback. And when we finally came up with the flavor, the people went crazy. They love this flavor so much, they couldn't wait to continue to purchase this product. But we were getting feedback from distributors and brokers and even the buyers and the managers of the grocery stores that they can't see the Dortmunder beer. So the good news is our job is to report back to Great Lakes and explain this to them. And they said, you know what? Let's come up with a new label, which we did. So we'll have a new label in two weeks. So in the next, uh, by the end of May, on the shelves, we'll have our new label of the beer mustard. Um, it's a fantastic partnership. They're fantastic to work with. What we're trying to do to expand even more sales, because we've done demos in the beer section. So when people on the weekends going on their trips or whatever, and they beeline to the beer section, they're grabbing the mustard. But beer distributors don't want to sell mustard. And mustard distributors, we're not in the beer business. But how do we get it into the beer section besides the condiment section? We're still working on that. We will find a way. Don't have that answered totally. The next letter, and I want to get through this, is what am I on, D? Oh, E? 
Execute. Well, that's what I was trying. Now we're going to execute this. And I, most of the stuff that I talked about was executing it, of how we went about doing this. From demos, creating a, a run. You want to create so many prototypes and how much mustard do you want to, how many drums do you want to create. I don't want a warehouse filled with pallets and pallets if it doesn't get, if it doesn't start selling. So we do so many prototypes, uh, maybe a couple pallets, get it out on the shelves and see how well it does so we're not stuck with it. It just so happens now the pallets are selling very quickly. So that's executing the product. Thanks, Nancy. She keeps me on my toes. D is for direction. What direction are we going to take with this product? Where are we going to go with this product? Are we going to stay local, regional, national, international? We have a lot of experience with um, the buyer's mission through Ohio Proud, where they help promote international food trade. So I go to New York at the end of June for the fancy food show and make presentations to seven different countries that are interested in our product at this time. So we're gathering a lot of information and continue to expanding the business. The last S is for, the last letter S is for surround. Surround yourself around talented people. Get involved. Successful people who can guide, consult, and most important, provide resources for you. Listen to learn. Let them talk. But you make the final decision of what you want to do. Everybody can't wait to say something. And they, sometimes when you're trying to make a project and somebody says, well, tell me about what you do. All of a sudden, you don't know anything about them or their company because time's up. And he says, thank you for your time. You want to ask them as much, many questions as you possibly can. Let them do the talking. In closing, empower your employees. And I think we talked about that briefly, Catherine. Let them take responsibility. Don't over look over their shoulder every time. They'll know what they're doing. That's why you brought them in. When the artist created our sign like that, I'm not going to sit there and look over his shoulder. He knows what I'm looking for. He knows what I wanted to create. Let him do what he's capable of doing. And then if we have to tweak it or make some adjustments, we will. A friend once told me the difference between a good product and a great product is the people behind the concept. That's what makes it work. I want to close with a poem, if I may. Um, a poem that I've been reading since high school. And uh, it just really hits home for me. In 1968, the famous running back, Gail Sayers, for the Chicago Bears was playing against the San Francisco 49ers. Kermit Alexander tackles Gail Sayers and explodes his knee in four different places. When Gail Sayers was laying in the hospital, realizing this is most likely the demise of his career, he receives a get well card from another player from the Houston Oilers named Don Glosserman. And in that get well card was a poem. I'm going to read you a one paragraph poem. God has given me this day to do as I will. I could waste it or use it for good. What I do today is very important because I'm trading a day in my life for it. When tomorrow comes, this day will be gone forever, leaving behind something I traded for it. I want it to be gain, not loss, good, not evil, success, not failure, in order that I should never forget the price I paid for it. This poem was given to Gail Sayers by Don Glosserman while recovering from knee surgery, referenced from the book, I Am Third. Thank you for your time. Can we ask any questions? I believe at the end they wanted to, if I'm not mistaken, Polly said. Can I move this? Because I'm going to throw stuff off.
I hate podiums. <laughs> I also hate microphones, but I'll deal with it. Um, okay, I'm curious, actually, if I could survey the room briefly. Who in here uh, ha is at the concept level of starting a company? Is anybody here that just have an idea, maybe thinking about it? How many of you actually have small businesses? The rest of the room, why are you here? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you want to know how to grow your business. Um, so I'm going to give a very different perspective uh, because I'm very early on in this entrepreneurship game. Um, and my startup company is actually still pre-revenue. So I'm going to share with you a little bit about what that very early uh, startup experience has been like for us here in Northeast Ohio. I'll tell you a little bit about my personal story and what we hope to do with the company uh, as, as we move forward. So um, just a little bit about me. I grew up in Aurora, not too far from here. Uh, and a unique thing about my past and really what I believe led me to become an entrepreneur is that I was homeschooled, which is kind of different. Uh, so I like to say that I experienced my education rather than being placed into an educational system. And that type of thinking and that mindset carried over to when I started college at the University of Akron. Uh, I loved technology when I was growing up. I grew up across the street from Geauga Lake. I'm sure many of you remember that. And I loved roller coasters. So I wanted to learn how to design them. And somebody gave me the idea, well, you should become an engineer to do that. Uh, and I said, all right, well, I guess I'll give it a shot. So I went to Akron. Uh, and, you know, I went there, and having this homeschool background, I got there my freshman year, and I was absolutely bored to tears in my engineering coursework. And I thought, oh, geez, what am I going to do? Well, a professor and a faculty member came to me and said, well, you know, we have these student project teams and research projects. Why don't you try that? So I said, okay, I'll get involved in this research project. One of those was with a local electric vehicle company by the name of Myers Motors, and they were located out of Tolmage, Ohio. And they came to the University of Akron, and said, hey, uh, we don't want our batteries to catch on fire. How many of you have heard about the hoverboards that this has been a problem with? Those toys that they're taking off the shelves, all this. Yeah, same problem, right? That's a basic idea. They came to us as students and said, fix this for us. So this was the start um, to the startup company. We realized that what we were doing is we were actually developing a product for a company. And so myself and my co-founder, neither of us having a business background at all, a couple of engineering nerds, decided to enter a student business plan competition called the Launch Town Business Plan Competition. And this was back in 2010. And we almost entered on a whim. Uh, but we ended up being finalists in this competition. And we said, well, maybe we're on to something here. Maybe we should keep pursuing this. And honestly, when you're a student with an idea, trying to pursue your degree, trying to maintain a job and get a co-op, it was a little bit difficult for us to get our footing. And it took us a few years to build our team. Uh, but in 2012, we, were, we had our first success with our first business competition. It was a clean tech business competition out of Chicago. And actually, I'm proud to say Professor Shell Font right here uh, gave us some funding so we could afford to go to Chicago for that trip. So thank you very much, Bob, uh, for believing in us, because uh, that's what we need. Uh, we needed the community to support us in this. So we went to Chicago and got our first $10,000 in funding, and we thought we were just going to be the biggest success. We were the next Facebook. We were going to take off like this. Um, but we went through some change. We, as many startups do, uh, we realized that we had to go through a pivot. Um, and this is probably the most important lesson that we've learned so far, is we realize that a lot of times what happens in university environments is that you have a technology that's not actually solving a need in the marketplace. Uh, so we realized there was no market for this product. So we had to change what we were doing. And this is a, an extremely important point for us because we thought, well, we could give up now or we could try to take the knowledge and skills that we have and actually find a problem in the marketplace. Right? So we were in this position where we were searching for a need. And what we identified is that in the clean energy industry, a major hurdle to the adoption of battery packs is the power inverter. And for all of you non-engineers, just imagine it's a big, heavy, inefficient, costly piece of equipment that you need to install with a battery pack. Well, we've come up with a way now with our product to get rid of power inverters, essentially, with batteries. And we have a battery operating system, and it's called Cognacell. 
uh, basically meaning smart cell. This is an electronic product that's designed into the battery pack by OEMs and systems integrators. And we're still working on product development today. Um, it's been a challenge. Maybe a lot of you know that the funding environment in Northeast Ohio is a little bit challenging right now, in particular for hardware startup companies like us that need a significant investment and significant time to get our product to market. So how have we done it? Um, aside from taking advantage of the Third Frontier program, which is extremely useful for us, the Glide Innovation Fund, some other small local grants and business plan competitions, what we found is that there's a great opportunity right now uh, for strategic industry partnerships, particularly if you're starting a technology company. Uh, and the opportunity that we found was this. Um, large corporations, you know, the, the Eatons, the, the BMWs, the large companies are looking for innovative technologies to maybe acquire or license um, because they don't necessarily have the capacity in-house to, to do that sort of innovation. So we found opportunities there to partner with large organizations. And they are helping to fund our product development at this point. So where we are now is we're actually living in the Akron Global Business Accelerator. It's a great uh, building if you've never been there down in Akron, Ohio. Uh, and the, the, the community and the ecosystem in Akron has been extremely supportive to us. And um, now to transition just a little bit to you know, our future and, and, and my role in that organization, um, what we're doing now, I guess a couple pieces of, of, of uh, news for us is we're working on a pilot project in Akron to demonstrate this technology. There was in Cranes Cleveland just a bit ago, we're putting solar panels on the roof of the business incubator. We'll be doing our first pilot there. It's a great project. Uh, with the city of Akron and the business incubator. And beyond that, I'll be going to pitch in Silicon Valley uh, in June for, a wimp, for the Women's Startup Challenge. I'm one of 10 women going out there, and we just found out that we got into this clean tech open business incubator program. So lots of traction uh, on that front. And for me personally, if I could leave you with uh, sort of a little bit of my personal story, you know, what do I want to see with the company? Um, a lot of people look at us and they say, well, six years in, you know, and you guys don't, you guys aren't making money yet. Aren't you, aren't you thinking that's a problem? I say, my goodness, you know, I think it took uh, Sam Walton and Walmart maybe 23 years before they started expanding beyond their first store. Um, entrepreneurship and startups aren't always an overnight success, and that's a huge lesson that we've learned and that it's more of an iterative process. Um, but us and our team are very passionate about our idea uh, so we're going to keep adjusting, adjusting our team as needed, hoping that we'll be successful one day. And for me, what I really love, and part of my bio, uh, talked a little bit about how I really enjoy public speaking, more specifically for students. Um, I think that we have a fantastic opportunity uh, to capture the entrepreneurial mindset when students are very young and very creative by nature. Uh, I think that's part of what I learned as a result of being homeschooled, to bring it full circle that starting and experiencing education at a very young age helped me to uh, look at entrepreneurship as an opportunity rather than something that was very scary and frightening. So what I'd like to do with my career in addition to running the startup is to continue on that path to help out educating uh, students in entrepreneurship and a few ways uh, that I'm doing that are through the Excel Center at the University of Akron, working with some fantastic uh, professors, faculty members, and other individuals, um, and also through the Launch League startup community. Um, a big piece about being successful in entrepreneurship is that it's really scary if you do it alone. Uh, and that was one of the biggest missing pieces that I saw when I first started the company uh, was that I didn't know any other local entrepreneurs. And that's a scary thing. And now there's a community in Akron uh, that's fixing that problem or trying to address that problem and to connect, provide uh, an ecosystem where entrepreneurs can meet one another, share resources, uh, and hopefully increase retention and success for entrepreneurs here in Northeast Ohio. So of course, um, I think that that will conclude my formal presentation and I'd be more than happy to answer your questions later, but I'll hand the microphone over to our final speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much. Capital, contacts, and courage. So th those are definitely the three things that I think are important for an entrepreneur. I think you guys might need to stand a little. Would you like a seventh inning stretch? Stand up. I'm going to ask you to sit when you believe that one of these three words is the most important for an entrepreneur. How many of you feel it's capital? Go ahead and sit if you think it is capital. How many of you think it's contacts? Go ahead and sit. Ah, the people who are standing, go ahead and sit. 
The answer is courage. That was my problem, becoming an entrepreneur. You see, where I grew up, Willoughby Hills, Ohio, at that time, there wasn't a lot to do. We were the kids who had the MDA carnivals. I was a franchisor at a young age. We had a franchise lemonade stand, but little kids down the road, okay, we were kind of bullies. But it's true. We took 10% of their sales because we taught them how to make lemonade. So our story was we were just doing this crazy entrepreneurial stuff. And for me, as you know, I'm a marketer, a brander, and we also do advertising. So let me tell you about my first failure. My failure was that I thought the Joe Von Musk company, who had these ads, I didn't like their ads. And again, I'm like in, I don't know, third grade. So I take my dad's camera, and I take some beautiful leaves and rocks, and I send it to them, and I say, this is what you should be using. I keep sending and sending and sending. They never wrote me back. <laughs> now, I could have easily stopped and said, look, I really don't know what I'm doing, but I didn't. And let me tell you what helped me. I believe, and you heard in both of the speakers, we talked about team. But I, me as the third speaker, let me tell you, Cleveland Bridge Builders, for me, my leadership program, was when I really saw my value. I saw my return on investment. So first thing on our website as well, what we've done. Um, most of our clients are corporate. They're colleges, hospitals, and banks. And I do help some startups. I love doing that work. And it is the visual, but it is the strategy of the brand. But we say as entrepreneurs that we have to listen. And let me just say to you, sometimes you're forced to listen. I started Miracle Resources in August of 2003. We would bid on 16 things, and we'd get like 13 of them. We were really growing. Year two, I wanted the Cleveland Clinic, Dunkin' Donuts, and American Red Cross. Year two, we had them. We were working with them. We were excelling, growing, 12 full-time staff. Then 2007 hits, and it just doesn't feel right. There's less things to bid on. 2008, 2009, you know what I'm talking about, whether you call it the Great Recession or whatever. We always did a trade show every year where we had 35 competitors in a hallway. 35 of our competitors were having tables. I brought balloons just to stand out. I tried to do anything I could. Can you imagine me as a young entrepreneur? And there's 35 tables of your competitors. 2009, it's us. I'm the only one left with the table. How many of you think I felt good about that, that there were none of my competitors in the room? You think I felt good, don't you? I didn't. I could almost cry telling you this. Here's why. These people went out of business. Guys, I had it bad. When things crashed, I had 12 full-time people. I had a client who said to me, I can't pay you. You've done a great job. It has nothing to do with you guys. I can't pay you. I have $8,000 in payroll to make. I've got $4,000 in the bank. What do I do? I go to the park and cry like a little girl. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. And then I pull up my bootstraps, get the money, I make payroll. You got to make payroll. And we were lucrative from the first months of business. We were bringing in money. I mean, the model was working, but you guys know it wasn't out there to get. I called one of my competitors, this is when things were bad, and said, can you take my people for six months? They'd been in business 25 years. I said, can you just take them for six months? Pay them, and then I'll come back. You know, we'll do some stuff with you. They said, Catherine, you don't know this, but we're closing. And they're a big firm. I'm not going to name their name, but they're a big firm out of Cleveland. They're done. I didn't feel good about that, guys, because my relationship with my entrepreneurial family, this great guy right here, I have always had a relationship that, you know, if I wanted to go to Europe for six weeks, somebody would help out. Or if my family got sick, we would help each other. I did not feel good that they were gone because here's what I learned. We all had to become what we call in marketing the Swiss Army Knife. Meaning, you're good at website, you're good at video, you're good at events, you're good at social media. But what I said and why we're still alive, I'm going to farm out the stuff that I'm not as strong in. I farm out some of the social media piece. I have freelancers who work for me. Right now, about 35 of them. But let me tell you, as much as I talk about capital contacts and courage, if I didn't have the courage when things were so tough, I wouldn't have made it. There's no way I'd be standing in front of you today. But listening was something I was forced to do, and we were forced to change. Then we got into strategy, and here's where the uniqueness came in. The uniqueness is, as you can see behind me, we're a marketing training firm. Who does that? 
You guys don't know anybody else who does that, do you? Raise your hand if you do. Here's what we found, and this is why we have it on the front page of the website. We found that when we would meet CMOs, chief marketing officers, they've done an amazing creative campaign, but they're upset because the team's not following them. You can probably see what the problem is. They've got a great idea, but the team's not on board. So what we created is a product called Brand Plus Team Equals Revenue. It's marketing, it's HR, and it's revenue building. Oh, go do your low ropes course. You're not going to get what I've got to offer. What I've got to offer is an interactive, customized program where I go into companies and work with them. I don't tell them how to be a brand ambassador. Who wants to be told what to do? No one. This is exciting, energizing. Because guys, here's what I didn't understand as an entrepreneur. Why do we send the CEO and the leadership team to a training, but we send the administrative staffs to another training, then we send the social media people to another training? No one's trained together. There's expectations in the workplace about how we reflect the brand, but we don't talk about them. We have a first session called respectful communication. Why would we have that as a marketing firm? Because here's the problem. In 2010, I flew around this country teaching people about social media and social media etiquette. I had C-level executives calling me saying, my people are going home and talking really bad about the company. I just spent all this money on billboards and bus cards and videos. The people in the company don't want to be told what to do. But when we train together and get on team charters, we're stronger. So here's where the success piece comes in. We had the marketing and the PR side down. We grew the training piece. It's now patented. It is now trademarked. I have 35 trainers who work with me. I'll expand it across the US. That's the goal first. It's not a global goal. Here's why. Every company should have that. We all say we love to brand. We are a brand, are we not? We all have our own strategic personal brand. But we expect from people without giving them the training. That doesn't work in my mind. So strategy is the next part. So it's listening, then strategy. Now the next thing, because you can tell I'm moving around, so you can probably see there's a little ADHD going on. Let's be honest. Every entrepreneur has it. The F for me is focus. I wrote a quote recently, and it says, ask yourself, is this a test, a temptation, or is it treasure? Many ideas come into my head as an entrepreneur. Not all of them should be executed, right? So I have to focus, and that focus for me has led to our success. But how I want to end with you is the next F, and for me, that's faith. My faith to keep going when things were bad, when I'm crying in the park because I can't make payroll, remember? And now I say to you, had I not had that faith and that hope, it wouldn't have got me through. I meet a lot of entrepreneurs and their problem is limited beliefs. They have limited thinking. That stops them. And here's our problem with that. When we have that limited belief, my entrepreneur family, we can talk with and be real and have real conversations. That's what keeps us going. So as a review, I said to you, again, from the beginning, it took courage. And that led to great listening. That led to great strategy. It led to focus and then faith to stop those limiting beliefs. Entrepreneurs, I don't know in this room who's a startup, who has a business, who's not doing well, who's doing well, who's ready to cash it in and say, look, I want to go back and take a corporate job. I don't know. Some of you in the audience, maybe people will say, I really want to do this, but I'm not sure I can take that first leap. Let me say to you this. When it comes to Akron, Ohio, and Northeast Ohio, and I've traveled a lot, I tend to stay here so much more than I want to. We've got a great entrepreneurial family. We've got amazing people. I mean, there's somebody in your front row who I've learned so much from. And just dive in and start coming to things and talking with us. And Polly, thanks again for putting this together because it is a great night. Now, I have a gift for you, if you can remember. Who can tell me my three C's? Fast, raise your hand, say it. Ooh, I heard a voice, but I saw your hand. Who had the great voice? Is that you? Was that you? I think you did, too. Thank you very much. Enjoy. Any um, comments, questions? Because now we're going to move into the panel. Right, Polly? OK. And thank you for listening.
Yes. I have to think this mustard has a bigger market than the rest of the Where else do you sell it and how did you get it? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, we might have to have you on our board because we always like <laughs> <laughs> ways of, but um, we, um, when we took over the company, we looked at that. We have a, a plan and a direction when we acquired the company. Uh, yeah, no, that's okay. We have uh, uh, a group of uh, partners that uh, acquired a company from the family, the three generations. Uh, one of the reasons, uh, just briefly, why they uh, needed to let this company go is there were two grandchildren left, very talented. And one of the uh, grandchildren, unfortunately, who was my uh, mentor and uh, prepared me for taking over this company, uh, became a very good friend of mine on a personal level as well. Uh, we lost him uh, five and a half months ago to cancer that he suffered for about four years. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, one of the reasons why um, uh, the, the third generation uh, was looking for the right team to take over. Um, but answering your questions, we have expanded to other ballparks at this time. I'm thinking Wisconsin, all of Wisconsin. Well, the, uh, a lot of people that uh, follow mustards, uh, there's about 3,000 mustards at the Mustard Museum in Wisconsin, and we're the number one mustard being sold on their website. Wow, that's good. So that's very exciting for us. Uh, you said you have to win the confidence of your distributors. Can you elaborate on that? What do you mean by winning the confidence? Of well, it works uh, hand in hand with uh, both parties. There's many dis different distributors, and you want to find out where, what areas and what geographical areas that they focus on and they concentrate on. Some distributors tell you they could find you this pie in the sky and they're going to do all this for you. And then you find out later that they're representing hundreds and hundreds of products. So you kind of get left behind. You become a little bit of a number. I experienced that when I was at Ohio State University in a classroom uh, until I transferred to a smaller school. Sometimes that's good for some people, but not for others. Um, we interview them. They interview us. Uh, they have to have the passion. They have to have the feel for it. They have to uh, decide. We, we want their salespeople uh, to carry this product in their briefcases. Some distributors don't do that, and some distributors uh, will definitely jump on board with that. Uh, Nancy and I just uh, were in uh, Detroit, and it was a phenomenal show. Uh, this particular uh, distributor has 253 salespeople, and they're going to carry all our SKUs all our products. Some distributors only want to carry certain sizes. Maybe they just cater the food service to restaurants for their deli section that's uh, going to just carry the gallons that we offer too. So it, it's, uh, it could be a win-win um, and uh, we have to just make sure that uh, um, they're there to uh, show results. So you have to earn each other's well, that's first and foremost. You also have to be careful that other distributors don't step on each other's feet and they're not in the same areas and they're not at the same stores. Then that could be a problem for us. Um, so you don't want to just spread yourself everywhere. You have to focus on the direction that you're going. And I always uh, felt that there's plenty for everybody if it's handled the right way. We uh, won the worldwide mustard competition in 1997 uh, in the classic um, deli uh, division. Um, and we won the gold medal. There's uh, the, the silver and the bronze. We happened to win the gold in 97. So that's uh, a, a big plus for us as well. Thanks for mentioning that. Yeah, we have a great partnership with the Indians. We're the only food product there uh, at the uh, Progressive Field that has the, um, uh, the rights to use Chief Wahoo on this particular bottle. When this bottle gets sold out of state, we have the gold medal uh, that Nancy indicated, which uh, I appreciate she mentioned that. Um, just briefly, the food service and the retail, um, 
Uh, they also have food service and retail at Progressive Field under the same roof, completely different organizations. One handles every time you buy a hot dog at a, at a concession stand, you see our Burtman dispensers. We have actually poly bags in that dispenser. So they could walk over there and just pump the mustard right on there. It's a little bit classier than putting a gallon out there. Then you have retail. So we're one of the top selling products in their souvenir shops and their gift shops. Um, and we have now licensing with them. Uh, they're selling the hats and the shirts in there as well, which is just an added uh, um, ancillary product that we have with them. So we have a really good partnership with them, which expands to uh, other ballparks because they work off of that, uh, uh, that model. Uh, I just wanted to mention, so I don't forget, because I might forget, and we could do this at the end. Please don't look under your chairs, but there's 12 chairs that have a Burtman sticker, and whoever has that sticker will get a 16-ounce bottle of mustard tonight. So look at it when we're done. The rest of us get a 12. Yeah, really? <laughs> Any questions for our, my partners here? <laughs> Ooh, this is an excellent question. <clears throat> I was in a nonprofit. I ran a nonprofit for 15 years, and I was the networker. I'm talking three days a week. I've been very, very blessed to be able to have an advisory board, have mentors. I made a really smart decision in 1994 that impacts my referrals to this day. Um, in 1994, I went to a seminar, and they talked about getting mentors. So I got 16 mentors for every facet of my life, like good marketers, good PR people, good entrepreneurs, good moms, good people of faith. Those 16 people have continued, and now they're on our advisory board, um, to this day to generate those leads. So I do a great job with the networking piece. Um, I would share, because our work is so corporate and feel, it's not B to C, it's B to B, um, that that networking has really made a huge difference for us. I'm very blessed, too, because as a paid professional speaker, I, I'm asked about my business. I may have the topic that I'm going in speaking on something else, but they're looking me up. They're looking at LinkedIn. I wish I could call myself a LinkedIn ninja. I'm pretty, I'm pretty good. I'm not at ninja yet, but I'm good on my LinkedIn, and that helps me as well. So I've been very, very blessed to have people who help me and generate those leads, those referrals. Oh, I was trying to pass to you. Okay. Um, so, Bill, I'll go with what he said, but I, I guess you talked about your previous career. Yes. What made, what made you make the jump to do your own thing? Oh, that's a great question. And uh, do you feel that you wish you'd done it sooner? If you mm -hmm. waited, you know, kind of more about the time and kind of why you made the jump and did those things. It's a great question. When you run a nonprofit, you're worried about payroll. I mean, you need to bring bringing in money. At, at the end of the day, I'm a fundraiser. I started, remember the lemonade stand thing? That was always like a big thing. So for me, I had no problem going out finding money. And so I felt confident. I actually had three board members who said, can you do some marketing for me? Can you do some ad stuff? Can you do this? And I said, no, I can't. You know, I'm a paid employee here. I knew I'd walk out with some something. But I'm married into an entrepreneurial family. The Miracles are big time entrepreneurs. The Robinsons, my maiden name, not. Now they are. But it was a huge jump. I was 38, I'm 52, I'll be 52 in May. I thought I would wait till I was 50 and I would retire. But again, when I started Miracle Resources, August of 2003, do you remember the brownout? For those who are younger, you may not. Do you remember? I mean, everything shut down, it was bad. The economy was pretty bad at that time, and there was a question of, were we going to lay off people? And I really didn't want to lay off anybody. I thought, I want to go. And I do believe that there's a moment as an entrepreneur when you say, it's time. And I had that. I had that feeling. But I also am not such a big risk taker because I knew that I had saved money. Remember I talked about capital? And I knew I had contacts. The last thing was the courage. So I'm probably less of a risk taker than most entrepreneurs because I wanted to have that. Also with me, I've always taught college. I got my MBA during the time of the business. 
And for me, teaching college is connecting to the younger generation, which then builds leads. I actually have students who are like, my mom's company needs you. And I get that business too. And I'm building connections with the younger generation. But I've also been able to take that teaching money and put it into retirement. Because as an entrepreneur, sometimes you're worried about your retirement. So I'm pretty strategic in that way. And I'm glad I didn't jump younger. The MBA made all the difference for me, the way that I think, the way that I strategize. So thank you. Courtney, do you have much assistance with patents and trademarks as you're going through this process? Yeah, well, our patent attorney is standing at the back of the room, so yes. <laughs> Hi, George. <laughs> um, yeah, well, uh, yeah, a couple things. I mean, we started out at the university, and so a fantastic resource for us as students was the Seed Legal Clinic uh, there. And so when we were first starting out, uh, they were very helpful, and we actually went through the process of licensing uh, a patent from the University of Akron, uh, which was a challenge um, a little bit for us to navigate, uh, but, uh, but it took us a year to negotiate that, so there's nothing that I'll say that that was that was certainly not an easy process for us, um, but we have had help. Uh, and you know, if it weren't for the business mentors in our life, it would have been a very uh, challenging process for us, for sure. Yeah. Any other questions for? Uh With the social media, we have a social media um, specialist that we brought aboard, um, and she works hand in hand with Nancy, and they bounce the ideas over, and they actually um, follow the media very carefully. So when we're on the Riz Show, when we're on uh, with Michael Simon, they're they're uh, in the newspaper when they did the. Um, launch of the beer muster last August and they talked about the infused opportunity with beer mixing with mustard and now with the recipes coming out and everything has just been focused and watching what's coming out and putting that into work and she would list that into your Instagram and your Facebook and your social um, and your uh, uh, Twitter accounts and people it's amazing how they follow it and people will take pictures of their mustard out of California. Somebody was in Hawaii showing it next to their cereal box. Somebody was cooking with it. So with all that social media, it actually brings in sales because people see that online, they're following it, and they go, well, I want to get a piece of that. I want to purchase that because I don't have it right now in California. Um, we get phone calls. Uh, are you um, uh, going to be selling it at Albertson soon in California? Uh, had a wonderful letter from a, a Boston Red Sox fan. And he said, this is an amazing mustard. My friend brought it to me. I took it. I snuck it into the Boston Red Sox at Fenway Park. Uh, I cannot be an Indians fan. As far as I go is your Burtman Ballpark mustard. So, um, uh, but you bring people, and like I mentioned before, you empower that to the right people that, that really understand the social media and then we just follow it as well uh, is that working for us is there another um, uh, link that's going to be taking off or uh, um, uh, when somebody downloads what am I thinking of Nancy uh, an app you know pretty soon there's uh, Facebook or Instagram or uh, Twitter there's going to be new ones coming out so we'll jump on the bandwagon with that um, we are, are looking at uh, Amazon right now. Uh, if you go online, I have no idea who's selling a case of this on Amazon, but it's selling fast for $69 a case, and they're getting it. Um, so, uh, you know, there's a lot of different, but we're very selective too. We just don't want to um, cheapen the product in such a way where somebody wants to show it that doesn't have the uh, integrity for this particular product. Everything. Yeah. Everything. I mean, right from the beginning when I started, 
before I had my MBA, uh, 2003, one of my advisory board members who I just had lunch with Monday said to me right from the beginning, I want to invest in you. Um, I didn't need that investment. I decided not to take that investment. I'm quite, I, I had quite a savings. I was ready, and I was ready to go right into contracts. But had I not had that belief, and I think that's part of when I mentioned courage and when you guys stood up and so many of you stood up on courage, you know, part of us as entrepreneurs, when we dive in and we have an idea, and your advisory board says to you, yeah, go for it, or no, let's tweak it this way. So to me, it's everything. How about you? Courtney, you wanna? I, I, um, it's uh, imperative. Uh, I couldn't be without our advisory board and our board of directors. And we actually have a spokesperson that runs those meetings. Otherwise, everybody's talking a lot of times at the same time because they're excited about the projects they're working on. Uh, when you empower opportunities, if I had to look over everybody's shoulder, I, I have enough on my table. So we all have our reports, and then we all take our turn talking about it. And then we have feedback. So we all have so much time to talk about that particular project and the pertinent information that we are working on now, projects that we're working on now. Who's handling that? Who's following up on that? Service. Without service in this business, you're, you're, you're done. You've got to provide the service. And, and, and then somebody has to handle, uh, not to be derogatory, but somebody has to handle sometimes some of the social media that you talked about is the protesting against the Chief Wahoo where that's, that's happening. There's, uh, I believe this will be eventually phased out over time. Uh, and they'll probably just go with the, the C on that. But other ballparks and other sporting uh, uh, teams are having that problems with their logos that are relating to uh, um, something similar with the Indians. But, um, but without the board, um, and I report to the board. I may have a, a, a nice position with the company, but I still have to report to somebody that we actually hire that's the media that, that handles everybody's turn. So now, all of a sudden, we're on another subject. I forgot something. Too bad, Randy. We, we could discuss it with the miscellaneous at the end, whoever has time to stay. Or we'll deal with it, or you'll deal with it on your own. So um, because my, my creativity is always, um, you have to pull the reins back a little bit on me. They, they watch me, because I'm on, the, on to, to the next project. I, I just get excited about the whole thing. I love when a, 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 a product and a project comes together and everybody's happy. That's, that's I, I love the faces of the buyers when you walk into a grocery store. We do have professional demo companies that do the demos, but I do a lot of the demos. And I like seeing what they, you know, when we didn't have the Dortmunder beer yet, but we were testing it to get their feedback, we thought we had the exact flavor and that was the flavor. The guy says, you know, you're a big tease. You're like my girlfriend. You're dangling that carrot right in front of me, and I can't buy the mustard right now because it wasn't ready. So um, now that, that, that we, we uh, got the product out, um, they're, they're all happy with it. So Something that I'd like to mention, um, and when I speak on entrepreneurship and I actually teach it at the college level, when we talk about the give back as an entrepreneur, you're letting people test drive your product. And so what I mean by that is your target market, when you're doing something where they can get a little bit of something or a discount on something so they can, again, experience working with you. Um, something that we created two years ago, we have an app, it's a free app. Um, it's called Your Miracle Resource. And everything that we talk about, like what I've talked about is on there. And again, called Your Miracle Resource. We give that away, and people are always like, oh my gosh, I like that, I like that resource. You gotta let people test drive you. Like, you wouldn't buy a car without test driving it, right? So when you're a young business, sometimes you'll do not all freebies, but maybe a couple little things, or engage in some way, and I think that is a huge start for an entrepreneur. Um, I appreciate, and I hope it's underneath my chair. I want some free mustard, right? We taste it, and we're like, oh my gosh, I have to have it. And then I want to share it at the 4th of July picnic. I mean, so if you're not letting people taste test, they aren't going to buy that $69 case, right? Well, we as entrepreneurs have to, again, let people test drive us a little bit. And that's part of a smart give back to get your target market. Not everybody gets this, 
it's for entre entrepreneurs, but our target market, they need to know us. In our case, very important, um, particularly uh, because you know the the value behind the patent and how we prove our value in the marketplace is really defined and encapsulated there. Um, it's very challenging when you're when you're dealing with control algorithms and circuit design uh, to go out there, and you know it's not a technology that you would see on Kickstarter or the Shark Tank. And so, uh, the IP is how we convey the value, and how when we're working with an OEM or, or a systems integrator, that's that's how we convey the value of the tech. Yeah. How are we? Uh, oh, we are way past the trip to Chicago. First of all, we have no payroll, so we're all working for free right now. Yeah. Well, no, we have we have two wonderful student interns, uh, and how we have been funded up until now is completely uh, through grants and business competitions, and also investment through strategic industry partnerships. And so that's how we've been hobbling along uh, for the past uh, year, year or two years, getting through that valley of death. Um, we've had to be a little bit creative. Uh, because from a technology standpoint, uh, we've been too early for the Series A funding that we need uh, to get the technology to market. And so uh, we've had to really bootstrap our way there uh, in, in terms of donating time. And uh, in a lot of cases, actually, this is just from that seminar I'm going to steal from the Entrepreneurial Learning Institute. Um, I think it's what less than a tenth of a percent of successful startup companies are actually funded by venture capital. Most are started with $10,000 or less. So... <laughs> Bootstrap, yeah. How much have you raised We've raised about a quarter billion total. Yeah. Tell us about the competition in California. Oh, the competition in California. You so. Have to be invited. Uh, yes, so I was one of hundreds of other women applicants, uh, and so it's and it was particularly for women in technology. And I thought, well, there must not be that many women in technology doing entrepreneurship, but apparently there were hundreds. Uh, and so uh, it was, you know, an application process, and it will be a four-minute pitch. Uh, I get to go to LinkedIn and, and pitch out there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it's going to be exciting. It's our first time uh, experiencing that Silicon Valley environment, so we're, I'm excited for the challenge. It'll be good. <laughs> yes, Mom. This is my parents are here. Oh, <laughs> hi, parents. <laughs> hi, parents. She's the one who homeschooled me. I'll credit. Uh huh. What has been your biggest challenge in getting the So here's the uh, the story. So again, you know, I had a full time job at NASA, and a lot of people would say, "Well, you're crazy to leave your full time job." And first of all, um, I was incredibly unhappy at that job uh, because I had this entrepreneurial spirit, and so I couldn't sit in a lab all day. I loved working with people, and I just felt that I wasn't contributing to the organization. Uh, so I was very dissatisfied there, and I knew I was satisfied working with the startup company. And so uh, that, in addition to you know. Sometimes what lights a fire under you is if you see something crashing and burning. And so we've had probably our biggest challenge has been, um, you know, working with working through team issues. It's it's been a big challenge to find the right group of mentors, the right group of advisors, and we've gone through uh, a lot of challenges with just our team and our leadership. Uh, and so it really inspired me to say, hey, I need to either make a decision that I'm going to commit and go on board and go on board full time to fix it, or the company's not going to move forward. And so I faced this decision point. In addition to knowing that this is what I'm really passionate about. Out, and that pushed me to say, okay, I'm going to admit full time to this company. Uh, and that that space being there where you sort of uh, jump into the deep end, you learn how to swim very quickly, and it's incredible how much you can accomplish when you make a decision like that. Um, just in the amount of time that I've sort of been rolling without a steady paycheck, um, it's incredible how motivated you get very quickly and how much you can accomplish in a small amount of time. And just seeing the progress and how that's been helping the company uh, is incredible. just the most rewarding experience you can go through. So I think that maybe answers your question, which was a good one. <laughs> Thanks. Good job, Mom and Dad. <laughs> Will there be more Friday night? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I have a question for Catherine. Uh, 
Uh, near the end, you summarized your uh, you summarized your whole presentation, sort of like in flow. Can you reiterate that? You said it very quickly. And I don't think <laughs> First for me was listening, but remember what I said to you guys, I was forced to listen. When you go into a trade show and there are there's no tables and most people would say, yeah. But what I saw was, again, a horrible time. I don't know how many of you felt it, but I felt it like 2007. It really started to pinch. So listening and then changing through that listening. And then being strategic. You know, 2008, I started my MBA. Before the MBA, I had horrible judgment on financial matters and had a bad accountant, um, had to go through huge strategy changes, and MBA changed that, so strategy would be next. Then I talked about focus, and with focus, lasering in. There are so many times something will come up, and that quote helps me. Is this a test? Is this a temptation or is this real treasure? And that helps me focus. And then the last part I talked about was faith. I had to get away from the limited thinking, the limited beliefs. Um, with the training program that I mentioned, the brand plus team equals revenue, um, we have an advisor. He is an HR person. Uh, most people call him a curmudgeon. And when we did one of our first ones, it was for one, a referral he gave us. And afterwards, he beelined to me, and I thought, oh, no, something didn't go well. I thought it went well, but I wasn't sure. And he said, Catherine, what you have created is awesome. It's fabulous. Everyone needs this. This is a guy who's not going to say that to you, ever. If you knew him, you would be, like, running from him. And I thought, you know, Catherine, why didn't you see that? So I had a limited belief, you see? So those would be mine. Again, it would be listening, then moving to strategy, then moving to focus, and then moving to faith. Those are what I had shared. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. <laughs> I'll ask who he is. I got, a, I got a lot of people helping me with that, but I love it. I love the feedback. <laughs> it's perfect. Wow. That's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> and just a little plug for Courtney. She's speaking Friday night in a unique format. It's six minutes, uh, 20 slides, and the event is pronounced... Pecha Kucha. It's Pecha Kucha. <laughs> I'm going to be there to see her. Um, I had pre-registered. It's free if you guys want to go. It's at the Bit Factory. Last I looked, there were still seats. Yeah, I think there's still and seats. And she's one of the eight presenters. Yeah. It's a really cool event. This is their third. It's like a, it's a Pecha Kucha originated in Japan, so it's like a fast-paced TED Talk kind of a format. So it's a real challenge for the speakers, but there's a whole unique uh, plethora of, of other speakers along with me, not just entrepreneurs. So, very interesting event. Thank you for the plug. <laughs> you deserve it. Oh, that's great. Hi, my name is Rachel. Um, you mentioned having mentors and mentees. Um, what advice would you give to I cried when I read Emeth. I cried because that's who I was in the very beginning of my company. I was the technician who was doing the work. I wasn't running the business. I was doing the work. Emeth made me cry. Fabulous book. No, I don't know. I don't know if I had. I can't say that I had one, but I mean, if I ever need inspiration, I'll go and watch some TED Talks. So stuff by Dan Pink and Simon Sinek, uh, Ken Robinson, and very all very inspirational to me and so kind of the millennial perspective I do read books um, but I wouldn't say there's one in particular uh, that that I would that I would recommend more than others but um, you know the the TED talks and some of those those speakers have been very inspirational to me yeah what were those speakers again? Uh, Dan Pink he's a great book drive um, talks about human motivation theory fascinating read uh, Simon Sinek talk his TED talk on the golden circle is extremely uh, extremely wonderful the what why and how of what you're doing motivation yeah. uh, and Ken Robinson speaks more so on the educating for entrepreneurship topics that I love a lot <laughs> 
I think I relate uh, back to uh, athletics, um, uh, being a high school basketball coach for over 17 years. I spent a lot of time at camps and with some of the top college and pro co coaches. And just to hear the inspiration of um, how they got involved in the industry and, and their future and what they want to do and what they want to do with their players and their kids and the future of their kids. And um, to listen to, I think what struck me the strongest was uh, when I spent some time listening uh, to uh, Bobby Knight. And he said, what kept me in coaching for so long was the practices with the doors closed, no media, no cameras. This is how basketball should be really uh, looked at and where it was just him and his players and the coaches. So I got a lot of inspiration from reading their books and uh, relate a lot of the athletics to business and related a lot of business to my players when I was coaching. Actually, I have one more thing to add to that. Um, I just recently went through a leadership Akron program, and in that we went through the Gallup Strengths Finders uh, personality assessment, uh, which might sound you know like Myers Briggs, but it really helps you to identify where are your natural leadership strengths and where do you fit in a team. And uh, for me, it was like, oh my goodness, I wish I had done this uh, you know five years ago when I was first forming my team because it helps to identify. Who, where, what are your strengths and what are your weaknesses and how could you fill in your team to compensate uh, for your weak areas and how could you leverage those? Uh, so it's, it's a fantastic resource. And if you want to take their test online, I think it's like $15, but there's a fantastic book on Amazon and a lot of corporations and companies are starting to adopt it. So if you're in that very early stage, you're trying to figure out really what you're good at, I would highly recommend that as a resource. Uh, Strengths Finders uh, by Gallup. I think it's G A L L O P, if I'm not mistaken. If you like to look under your chair, if you have a Burtman sticker, you get a bottle of mustard. Did you put one in here or no? no I didn't.